Have you ever found yourself wondering, am I a Christian? Have you ever had doubts about whether or not you are truly saved? Some people can go through those times of doubting where they don't know actually if if they are a genuine believer or not. And you know there are some people who can play a good game where they can talk the Christian talk and they can pretend to walk the Christian walk while other Christians are watching. And these people know deep down in their hearts that they aren't true believers in Jesus Christ, but they know how to put on a good show for the sake of their parents or maybe some other person. Still, other people think that they are true Christians, and they might even be quite shocked or even insulted to be told that they weren't real believers according to what the Bible says, that they weren't biblical Christians. And so we know that there are fake Christians as well as genuine Christians in the church. Remember what the Lord Jesus calls them? He calls them the wheat and the tares. A tare is a weed that looks an awful lot like wheat. It can be very hard to distinguish the two until they are in full, ripe maturity. So tares look a lot like real wheat, but are actually weeds. And the Lord said that there will come a time when the two are separated. But you know what? Not only are there genuine and fake Christians in the church at large, there are genuine and fake believers here in this church. We may not know who they are. But if you find yourself wondering which category you fall into, then maybe today is a day where you do some real soul searching to figure out whether your faith is counterfeit or whether it is true. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Peter says this, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. And so Peter encourages us actually to make sure we are called and to be eager about being sure about this. And he does not mean there that we're we're to try to make our calling and election sure in the eyes of God, because it's already sure in the eyes of God. Instead, what Peter is talking about is that we are called to make our calling and our election sure in our own eyes. That we are to reach that assurance, that genuine assurance that yes, I know I have been called by God unto salvation. This means that we come to that strong and certain conviction that yes, I am a genuine Christian. A true believer in Jesus Christ. I myself became a believer at a very young age. The age of seven. And the first major difficulty that I had as a child in understanding my faith was how to know that I was truly saved. I struggled as a child with this assurance of salvation. I think many new believers go through that at any age because this is an important issue. Because if we don't know whether or not we are truly saved, we won't have assurance of our salvation and will be caught in this cycle of doubt. And so our passage today in the book of Colossians this morning is actually very helpful for this. Because we're going to see today one key way to know whether or not we are genuine Christians. If you recall We've said that Paul has been writing this letter to the church in Colossae because they have been thrown into doubt by a false teacher in their midst. So they're being thrown into confusion. This false teacher has entered into this church that Paul is writing to here, and he has caused problems. And so the the believers there are in doubt and confusion, and they are doubting two main things two important things, two key things. What are they doubting? Well, the two main things that they are doubting is they are doubting the person of Christ and the message of the gospel. 
And these are actually the two most important elements of the whole Christian faith. Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on the cross. It doesn't get more important than that. And so if you are doubting those two things, or if you get those two things wrong, then you have a big problem. And so Paul is writing this letter to help these believers in this city, in Colossae, navigate this doubt, to bring them out of doubt. He is reminding them who Jesus is and what the gospel is. That is, the message of what Christ has done on the cross. So he's writing this letter in order to display the glory of Christ and who he is as well as to display the correct gospel. And last Sunday, we looked at the first one. We saw the supremacy of Christ in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 20. And we learned there that the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the Son of God. He is the Redeemer who has paid our sin debt in full. He is the Revealer of the invisible God. He is the Creator through whom all things have come into being. He is the sustainer, through whom all things maintain their being. He is also the originator. He is the beginning of creation, not only of this old creation, but he is the beginner of the new creation as well. And we learned last week that he is the reconciler. He is the one who has made peace between God and man through his cross. And so last week we focused on that first key thing that was that the Colossians were doubting who Jesus is. Because if you recall, I've said that this false teacher, he was bringing down the glory of Jesus and he was magnifying the glory of angels. We will see that eventually. And Paul writes this letter in order to say, no, you can't bring Jesus down. You actually have to exalt him and bring him up. Paul has laid a glorious presentation of Christ before the Colossian believers so that the glory of Christ may eclipse anything else that might have been distracting the Colossians or throwing them into doubt or hesitation. You're interested in the worship of angels? Well, Christ is better than that. You're interested in observing special dates in the Jewish calendar? Well, Christ is better than that too. You're distracted by visions and highly controlled diets? Well, Christ is also better than all that, too. The Lord Jesus Christ is better than anything that you can bring in comparison. So Paul is saying, why are you focusing on other things? When the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the be-all and all. And so in our passage this morning... Since we've looked at that first aspect that was throwing the Colossians into doubt about who Jesus is, his identity, and Paul presents him as God, all the fullness of the deity was pleased to dwell in him. Now this morning we're going to move to the second issue that was causing the Colossian believers doubt and confusion, and that's the gospel. The gospel is about what Jesus Christ has done, who he is, We looked at that last week. Now we turn to what he has done on the cross. They need a reminder of what the gospel is, what the gospel means, and what Christ did on the cross. And this is what we see in this passage that we had just read to us, but I'm going to read it again so it's fresh in our minds as we go through it. Colossians 1, 21 to 29, and I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. 
Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So in verses 21 to 23, we receive a highly compacted expression of the gospel here. This is the gospel in a nutshell, covering the state and the situation that we were in prior to the work of Christ, and then what God did through the death of Christ on the cross, and now what we have in Christ as believers in his name. And so before we go in to unpack what the essence of the gospel is, let's look at verse 23 for a moment. Verse 23, Paul says there that what he has just described is the gospel. And he says, this is the gospel that you heard and that, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Let's stop for a moment to think about what Paul's saying here. Now, of course, Paul is using some exaggeration here, but he is claiming that the Christ he has just, just described, the divine Christ, and the gospel that he has just reviewed what Jesus has done on the cross is the same Christ and the same gospel that has been preached to every creature under heaven. So what does that mean? This means that if the Colossians now turn away to follow the charismatic teachings of a false teacher here, then what are they doing? They are turning away from what all of the churches teach. They are turning away from what all of the churches believe. They are turning to a false Jesus and a false gospel. So Paul says, this is the gospel that I have presented to you and every creature under heaven has heard it. If we look back at verse 6, we remember that Paul wrote there, all over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. Paul says this gospel message is going everywhere. It's going all over the place to all the nooks and crannies of the whole Roman Empire of all over the known world. And so what Paul is doing here is he's giving the Colossian believers a standard for orthodoxy. He's giving them a standard for orthodoxy. He's saying... You can get with this, or you can get with that. I say you get with this, because this is where it is. This is what's being preached all over the world. This is what all the churches believe. This is the gospel that's being shared with every creature under heaven. This is what is orthodox. And so if you Colossians turn away from this, then you are turning away from the true gospel and the true Son of God, and away from sound doctrine of the true and orthodox churches of God. As I said, you'd be turning away to something false, a false Jesus, a false gospel, a false doctrine towards false teaching. And so now let's look and let's unpack this gospel message. What is this gospel message? that's being preached to every creature under heaven. This gospel message that is growing and bearing fruit all over the world, Paul says. Well, let's read verses 21 to 23 again. Just three verses here. It says, once you were alienated from God. Wow, that's pretty heavy already, and that's just like five words in. Once you were alienated from God. It gets worse. Not only were you alienated, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, God has reconciled you 
by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. That's it, just three verses. And so first of all, it says that we were alienated from God and enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior. Alienated from God means like we were divorced from God. Enemies of God in our minds means that we hated Him. And evil behavior means everything that we said, we thought, and we did, the way we behaved in our lives was evil in the sight of a holy God. Look with me for a moment at the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 13. It may be on the same page of your Bibles, or maybe you might have to flip a page. Colossians 2.13 says this, the Apostle Paul says, When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. And that sounds a lot like Ephesians 2, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is the first point of the gospel, our state before God. The foundational premise of the gospel message is that we are sinners. We are hopelessly separated and divorced from God, banished from His presence, dead, uncircumcised enemies. It really doesn't get much worse than that. We may think that we're good people. But well, that doesn't matter if we're not good in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, we are dead, uncircumcised enemies. Deadness means that there was nothing that we could do to restore our relationship with God. A corpse is helpless. A corpse can do nothing. A corpse, the only thing that a corpse can do is rot. And so in our spiritual deadness, we could do nothing but stink and rot in sin. Uncircumcised or alienated. Uncircumcised means that we were unclean before God. Having nothing to please Him. We were an abomination in His sight. So that we could by no means stand in His presence before Him. Uncircumcision in spiritual terms means that we were filthy dirty in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. So we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually uncircumcised, unclean in the eyes of God. And finally, enemies were also called. Enemies means that we were actively hostile towards God. It was not as though we were just uninterested in God. It's not as though we were just ignoring Him in our love for sin. But rather, to be called an enemy in the mind against God, it's, it means that in our love of sin, we did everything we could to struggle against Him and rebel against His holy law. We were enemies. We were uncircumcised. We were dead. That is our situation apart from Jesus Christ. We were dead in sin, uncircumcised, unclean, as completely filthy in the sight of God, and we were enemies actively resisting and rebelling against Him. Not only did we want to have nothing to do with Him, but we hated Him. And now you may be thinking to yourself, well, before I became a believer, I didn't hate God. I didn't consider myself his enemy, and I didn't feel very dirty, matter of fact, and, and I didn't feel very dead. So what are you talking about, preacher? What is scripture talking about here? But it doesn't really matter what you think or how you feel, for the scriptures reveal what was actually the case from the perspective of God. In his eyes, you were an enemy. In his eyes, you were filthy, dirty. In his eyes, you were spiritually dead. 
And if we think about it, as a non-believer, there are only two possibilities. Either you believe in the existence of God, or you don't believe in the existence of God. And if you don't believe in the existence of God, what could be really a greater expression of hatred towards him than thinking, oh, you don't exist? I mean, that's pure hatred. But if, if you're a non-believer, but you do believe in his existence, but you don't commit your life to him, or you don't submit or surrender your life to his law, and you have no desire to really know him, isn't that also really an expression of contempt and hatred toward God? Before coming to faith in Jesus Christ, we were all like this. None of us gets to say, oh, I, I used to be really good, and then God made me a little better. No, we were all like this. We were all uncircumcised, spiritually dead enemies of God. And so we were totally alienated from Him, totally divorced, totally banished from His sight, totally alone. There was no possibility of us crossing that, that chasm of alienation unless God Himself got up and acted in salvation. And that's exactly what happened. That's what the Gospel declares. We couldn't do anything. God did everything. Amen. Look at verse 22 in chapter 1 again. These are beautiful, powerful words. It says, but now He, that's God, now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. So it doesn't say here that we reconciled ourselves to God. No, how could we do that? We were dead. Not by our faith or our belief in Christ or our by our choosing God. We could not while we were dead enemies. God had to be the one to act, and so he did. It says he has reconciled you. God is the one who did it. We are the ones who received it. We ask, how did God do this? It says, through the death of Christ's physical body. That's how God did it. He's using the language of sacrifice here. Paul is referring to Christ's body hanging on the altar of the cross like a lamb lying dead upon an altar. The sacrificial lamb had to be pure and unblemished but you know what? A lamb, a bull, a goat, it could only provide temporary ceremonial forgiveness for a single sin. But on the other hand, the Lamb of God was innocent and perfectly sinless. And He provides one sacrifice that provides eternal forgiveness for all sin, for all those who trust in Him. And so that's why, when we look at the second half of verse 22, we have this glorious and amazing statement. God did this, why? To present you holy in His sight. Yeah. What? I'm holy now? To present you holy in His sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Holy without blemish, free from accusation. So through the sacrifice of the Lord of glory on the altar of the cross, we who once were uncircumcised and dead enemies of God are now presented in the presence and sight of God as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. Hallelujah. Let's unpack those three terms briefly. Holiness. What does that mean? We are holy now in the eyes of God. This means that we have been declared good. Well, before we weren't good. Now we've been declared good. Or righteous with a capital R. Now we are pleasing in the sight of God. We are innocent in His eyes. We have been found acceptable through faith in Jesus Christ. We are now set apart as his people, as his children. This is what holiness means. We are now holy. This is not a holiness that is ours. 
We can't look down upon anybody and say, I'm holier than you are. No, this is a holiness that is found in Christ alone. So we are holy now in Him. Secondly, it says, without blemish. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we are perfect in God's eyes. We are pure. There's no defect, no spot anymore, not a single blemish in us that God sees. And again, this perfection is not flowing out of us. We're still stinky people. This perfection does not flow out of us. Because if it did, if the perfection was coming out of us, it would stop really quickly. We couldn't maintain it. We'd be continually offering ourselves blemished to God. Instead, our perfection is displayed and maintained in Christ before God the Father. So Christ is our holiness. Christ is our blemishlessness. If that's even a word. And Christ is our freedom from accusation. So we are free from accusation. What does that mean? That means in Christ we are declared not guilty. Let's think about this for a moment. Free from accusation. Who's the one who makes accusations? The devil. That's right. That's actually what the word devil means. Did you know that? Devil means accuser. That's what Satan means as well. Satan and devil mean the same thing. Satan means accuser. He accuses us before God. He says to God, God, do you know what this so-called child of yours has done? She totally deserves your just judgment. He is guilty and needs to be destroyed, God. After all, he has broken your holy law, and you cannot stand sin in your presence. Isn't that right, God? Satan is the accuser. He's also the accuser in our ear as well. He whispers in our ear, Are you really a Christian? How on earth can you call yourself a Christian? He is the accuser who accuses us before God and accuses God before us. He's the accuser. But here, the Bible says we are free from accusation. Because whenever the devil accuses us, you know what we have to do? We have to direct him towards Jesus. Say, stop talking to me. Talk to him. Because in Christ, we are free from accusation. So whenever the devil accuses us, we point him towards Christ. And whenever the devil reminds God of our imperfection, God points him towards Christ's perfection. So whenever the devil says to God, this person deserves your judgment, oh God, God says, but have you taken a look at my pure son? There is no longer any room or basis for accusation. Have you ever watched a crime drama on TV? They talk about a criminal, and the detective says, he's got a rap sheet that's as long as my arm. A rap sheet is the list of charges against a criminal. Well, you and I also had a rap sheet, and it was much longer than our arm, let me tell you. It would roll down the street for a mile. But what the gospel declares is that that rap sheet, all those charges that stood against us, have been torn up. Those criminal charges, all of them, every single one of those criminal charges that were against us have been dropped. We are declared not guilty before God. Let me read to you another portion of scripture found in Romans 8. We may have it on the screen up behind me, so you don't have to go there. Romans chapter 8, listen to this, verse 31, supporting this point. We no longer have a criminal rap sheet before God. If we are in Christ, it says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Here it is. Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. So there's no one left. There's no one left to bring charges. There's no one left to condemn. And that's why in that same passage, Romans chapter 8, the very first verse says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All the criminal charges have been, brought, have been dropped. The rap sheet has been torn up. We are holy in God's sight. We are without blemish. And we are free from accusation. So what is the gospel? The gospel in these three verses, the message is this. We were once alienated from God as dead, uncircumcised enemies who could only hate Him. Yet now, He has reconciled us through Christ's sacrifice as living, holy children who can now only love Him. He has brought us from death unto life. From the kingdom of darkness, or the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of His beloved Son. The third aspect of the gospel comes in verse 23. If you look with me there, Paul says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. And so that is a calling for each of us. We are called to continue unmoved in faith, established and firm. You know what I love about Christians throughout all history? We are the most stubborn people who've ever lived. Because once we have Jesus, we're not going to let go. And nothing can take Jesus away from a stubborn Christian. Even the threat of death. Hopefully, even the threat of a, of a virus. Nothing can move us from true faith. And we are called to continue in that kind of stubborn, unmoving faith established and firm. Just because all of our perfection is found in Christ does not mean that we're now free to do whatever we want and go wherever we please. Because that would defeat the whole purpose of Christ's sacrifice. Amen. No, being reconciled to God at the same time means continuing in Him. I love that word that Paul uses. Continue in Him. Growing in love. For him, growing in knowledge of him through his word, pursuing holiness and fighting the flesh by the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever I think of unmovingness, I always think of my younger brother Josh. We see him from time to time. He comes and visits us. When my brother Josh was about six years old, uh, he was playing uh, tag football with all the big guys, like big, big guys. And he was six years old. I always remember we were playing uh, this tag football and this one really big guy, he must have been 250 pounds. He got the, he got the football and he, was, he broke through all of the other football players and he was running for the goal. And no one could catch him, but he was just chugging because he was a big guy, really big guy. And there's only one person on our team who stood between him and, and the goal line. That was six-year-old Josh, my little brother. And what would a normal person do if you're six years old and you see a 250-pound man running towards you? You would get out of the way, wouldn't you? But no, my little brother, six years old, he plants his feet. He looks up at him. And I, I've seen this as plain as this day in my mind. And he is all there. He is ready. He's going to stand. He's going to guard that goal. And so what happens is the, the big guy... I don't, he didn't plan his trajectory very well. He, he actually runs sort of over my brother, but he's trying not to hurt my brother, and so he falls, he jumps over him and falls, and the ball is down right there. So he does not score. And so I always remember that. My tiny little brother, just unmoved. He's not moving for nothing. And he made the play. 
I always remember that. When I think of unmoved, that's what I visualize in my head. Paul says that we are not to be moved from the hope, it says, held out in the gospel. And I know you must get tired of me saying it. I've said it many times before. You're going to hear it many times again. Hope should have a capital H. I encourage you, whenever you're reading Paul's letters, to take a pen and capitalize the H whenever we see this word hope. It's because Paul means something very specific. For him, hope is a certain expectation of salvation on the day of judgment, resulting in eternal life. He is saying here, do not be moved from the certain expectation you have of salvation. The gospel proclaims that if we place our faith in the sacrificial death of the Son of God, that we have full forgiveness so that we do not need to fear God's punishment and wrath on the day of judgment. This is the gospel message preached to every creature under heaven. And it's upon this gospel message that we are supposed to remain unmoved. In verses 24 to 25 of our passage, as we come near to the end here, Paul talks about how his service to the gospel also means service to the church, which is the body of Christ, he says. Paul can rejoice in the sufferings of Christ because those sufferings brought salvation, not just for the Colossian believers, but for all those who trust in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. Paul says here that it's even an honor for himself to suffer for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the church. Remember that the apostle is sitting in a Roman prison as he writes this letter. And he knows firsthand what it means to suffer insult and beatings and even stoning for the sake of the gospel. And he's telling the Colossians that the orthodox gospel message is worth suffering for. That he can even rejoice in it because his sufferings point to the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. So look with me at verse 26. Because here the Apostle Paul, he calls the gospel a mystery. He calls it a secret. It was a secret that was once kept hidden by God from former ages and generations so that they could not completely understand. But now... Now, this mysterious secret has been revealed to the saints. And the secret is declared in verse 27. It's a two-part secret. Part one, the first part of the secret, is that the Gentiles get to be included. The Gentiles get to get in on the mystery of salvation, and that's incredible for Paul. Those dirty, uncircumcised Gentiles had been outsiders and sinners and idolaters and polytheistic pagans all the way along, without God and without citizenship in Israel, separate from the covenants and promises given to Israel, and without hope in this life. But now they are to be included in the salvation for Israel brought by Israel's Messiah? Whoa, that was amazing. This is something totally new, totally unexpected, completely unheard of. The, and Gentiles don't even have to get circumcised. But they can have equal standing before God alongside Jews through faith in Christ? That's a great mystery indeed. But here's the second part of the secret. The second part of the mystery is the glorious riches. When Paul calls this part of the mystery glorious riches, he means that it has extravagant value and inestimable worth. There is nothing, nothing that can compare to this secret. Bring me all the riches and all the wealth of the world, all the fame, all the power, all the glory, and it will still pale in comparison with the secret of the heart of the gospel. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. By the way, that's another 
capital H. Another hope for us to capitalize. Because this means the certain expectation of glory, of eternal life, where we get to sit at the right hand of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God the Father. We're looking forward to an eternal glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The essential heart, or the core of the gospel message, is that Christ is in you. How? How is that possible? How can Christ be in a person? This means that when you put your faith and trust in him for salvation on the day of judgment, the Lord Jesus himself dwells in you by his Holy Spirit. Christ in you by his Holy Spirit, the hope of eternal life and glory. This is how you know if you are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. If you know that his spirit is dwelling within you. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says this. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Here in this verse, Paul gives us a test for seeing whether or not we are in the faith. And he commands us to apply this test to ourselves. In another passage, Romans 8, verse 9, Paul says that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, meaning the Holy Spirit, he does not belong to Christ. If you know that Christ Jesus is in you, then you pass the test. Basically, Paul is saying, no Christ in you, no hope of glory. Yes, Christ in you, yes, a hope of glory. If Christ Jesus dwells in you by his Holy Spirit, you know what? There's going to be evidence of that at work in your life. It's going to come out. There's going to be fruit. What is the fruit that the Holy Spirit provides as evidence that he is living inside a believer? Well, it's the hunger and thirst for what the Holy Spirit himself desires. A sincere love for God. A real love for God's people. And a heart for serving the body of Christ. A deep love for God's word. A longing to know God more and to do what pleases Him. A heart for the lost. A hatred for sin. A heartfelt desire to put the flesh to death. This is fruitful evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in a believer's life as He dwells within his or her heart. Let's close this morning by turning to Galatians 5, 16 to 25. You can turn there in your Bibles or I think we'll have it on the screen. In this passage, we see the fruit of the Spirit. But it's in this context of struggling against the flesh. And so we realize that the background to the fruit of the Spirit is the pursuit of holiness in our lives. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, His main role is to make us more holy. Because that's in His name. So here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says... So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Mm. So what have we learned this morning? The gospel message that has been preached to every creature under heaven is that while we were enemies of God, uncircumcised, unclean, alienated, dead in our sin, He reconciled us to Himself through the sacrifice of His Son so that as the Lord Jesus dwells within us by His Holy Spirit, we would grow in love for God and in the fruit of holiness in our daily lives, attaining to the perfection that we already possess in Christ. And so let us continue in this gospel message, brothers and sisters, firm, unmoved, established in the certain expectation we have of salvation and eternal life. Let's pray. Father God, what a powerful gospel you have given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. How we have seen last week who he is, his identity, that he is God and man at the same time. And yet he went to the cross and he did so in order to purchase our redemption, in order to tear up our rap sheet, in order to drop all the criminal charges that were against us, so that we could obtain full cleansing, so that we could be completely forgiven through faith in Him and through faith in His sacrifice made on the cross. Father, we are filled with sorrow to remember what we once were, that we were alienated from You, we were enemies in our minds against you because of our evil behavior. We were dead in our sins. We were uncircumcised and unclean and unfit to stand in your presence. And Father, if it was up to us, if it was up to our own strength, our own power, our own ingenuity, that's where we would remain. But Father, all praise goes to you, for you were the one who got up off your throne and you sent your Son into this world so that in his body that hung upon the altar of the cross, the pure and spotless Lamb of God wiped away the sin of everyone who believes in him. So that all of us who have put genuine faith in Jesus Christ and repented of our sin and surrendered our lives to his lordship can know that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, that we are holy in your sight, we are blameless before you, and we are free from all accusation. Not because of anything good we have done or anything good in us, but because of Jesus Christ. He is the be-all, end-all for us. Without Christ, we have no hope. But in Christ, we have all hope. Without Christ, we have nothing. But with Christ, we have everything. So, Father, we thank you for him. This day, may we, each and every one of us, Examine our hearts. Examine our lives. Am I in Christ? Is Christ in me? Have my sins been washed away by the blood of Christ through faith in Him? Or am I still alienated? Am I still dead in sin? Am I still an enemy of God? Do I have that hope of eternal life? Father, I pray that today would be the day of genuine repentance, of genuine surrender, of genuine commitment to you, of genuine faith 
in Jesus Christ. One that says, I surrender everything. I deny myself. Take up my cross and follow Jesus today. Mm. Father, would you work in our hearts that by your grace we may have that assurance that Christ is in us by his Holy Spirit if we have genuine faith in him. And Father, open up our eyes to the ways that your Holy Spirit is bearing fruit within our lives so that we may be encouraged. And when the accuser comes and whispers those accusations in our ears, may we always be pointing him to Christ, not making excuses for ourselves or trying to explain ourselves away, but just directing him to Jesus. To say, Jesus is my perfection. Jesus is my holiness. Jesus is my blamelessness. Jesus has taken away every criminal charge. Father, help us to grow in Christ as the Holy Spirit works within us. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.